Figuring out what skis work best for you requires knowing your ability and the type of skiing you participate in. Nowadays, we have many options to choose from, but that wasn't the case thousands of years ago. Skiing can date back to 5000 BC, where carvings on cave walls were found from ancient civilizations, with someone using two primitive skis, but only one pole. The oldest surviving ski estimated to be from 2500 BC. Since then, we have been able to track the evolution of skis and poles made, and how the purpose of skiing has changed for us in those times. Today we know skiing as a recreational or competitive sport, but its foundation was built for a much different purpose. In the beginning, hunters from the Stone Age would use them. They were actually much more convenient than snowshoes, as they were quieter and you could sneak up on the animals better. Skis were usually handmade by carving out blocks of wood by a family member. There was no mass production yet, but they came to be used across the Arctic regions. One singular ski pole was used to propel these hunters across the snow. And it wasn't even a pole. There was no grip, no baskets. It was really just a stick. In the 16th and 17th centuries, also known as the early modern period, skis were also used by Scandinavian farmers. By the 18th century, the Swedish army actually trained and competed on skis. They realized it was a form of exercise, and this is the first time people used skis as a hobby rather than just for survival. Before 1840, woodcarvers developed a cambered ski. The ski arched up in the middle to distribute the weight of the skier more effectively. There were two types of cambered skis, thick and thin. The thick ones were used to glide downward more effectively, but the thinner skis were more agile for turning and a smoother trail. They were lighter and easier to swing into a turn. The binding was really just a strap that went over the shoe and wasn't really steady. It didn't support the heel. For the first time, two poles were used, but they were no more than just straight sticks of bamboo. In 1868, the Telemark ski was introduced. This ski had a narrow underfoot, but the tip and the tail were wider. The ski flexed easier when tipped onto the edge, and the ski followed the shape of the turn rather than skidding sideways. A new binding was introduced to the factories too, a two-piece binding that held the heel and the toe in place and centralized the foot in the middle of the ski. In 1882, new skis were introduced that were made of more than just wood. High quality skis were made of strong, springy ash. Skis were started to be made of hickory in Norway. This required carbon steel hardware. However, hickory was a really good material for the ski as it was thinner and it was more flexible and it had good strength. On top of that, it glided more easily because of the smooth surface. In 1893, the first two-layered laminated ski was built. The laminate served as a purpose to hold the ski together. Unfortunately, it was not completely waterproof. After a few days of hard work, the laminate actually started to deteriorate and the ski fell apart. But mass production started, as the first ski factory was launched in Central Europe. In 1900, poles started to upgrade as well. One or two poles were used, with or without grips, or with or without baskets. The baskets were much bigger than today, measuring about 10 to 20 centimeters in diameter. In 1926, the segmented ski edge was introduced. This was a steel edge that was screwed into the ski in order to give it better grip on harder snow. The only problem was that segments would break in two or come loose, which made skiing impossible. People always had to carry packs of screws and glue to make sure that their ski never fell apart when they were going down the mountain. In 1932, the first successful three-layered laminated skis were made. They were made with waterproof glue, so they didn't delaminate easily. They were also vertically laminated, so this provided lighter, livelier, and stronger skis. The poles with baskets reached about 15 to 20 centimeters in diameter. They were made up of four leather straps that attached to a metal ring. In 1936, aluminum ski poles reached mass production in France. Poles were made with adjustable shafts so they could fit all ages and all heights. In the 1940s, vast improvements were made to skis each year. New materials were introduced to improve previous models and many ideas were taken from airplanes. People who designed skis were often aircraft engineers. They were often using the same material. In 1959, the first fiberglass ski was successfully created. Since then, new models have continued to improve. There has been a huge variety of skis made in the past 40 years, and more brands and makers are successful. Poles are now made with either fiberglass or aluminum, and the baskets are about 5 to 8 centimeters in diameter. Giant slalom ski poles are bent, which reduces drag at a high speed. Now it's time to talk about how to ski. There's no rule on how big your turns are. All you want to do is put your weight forward so you feel your shins on the front of your boots, 
This will give you more control of your turning and your legs won't be as sore at the end of the day. Secondly, you want to keep your arms forward. A lot of people make the mistake of dropping their arms. Pole planting is important for stability. When you turn right, you plant your right pole and vice versa. You also want to adjust your technique to the snow conditions. If there's firm, icy snow, you want to lean forward more and exert more force. On a powder day, you want to make this a lot more subtle and barely lean at all. The goal is to centralize your weight so your edge doesn't get caught up in the powder. The first step to making a turn is initiating. You want to roll your knees and ankles and lean your hip toward where you are turning. This will drive your body into the turn, but you want to keep your upper body still and quiet and let your lower body do all the work. Next is shaping the turn. Drive the outside knee forward to the inside toe binding. The greater the force, the more you carve. To exert an even greater force, you can engage your hips and shoulders. When finishing the turn, knees and ankles should roll back upright. The ski edge will lift out of the snow and your inside ski will act as a stabilizer. Then you repeat over and over again. This is the way alpine racers ski, but for the most part, it's your choice on how you want your form to look like. Whether you are a downhill racer, freestyle skier, or you just want to hit the slopes for fun, there are plenty of ways to ski the way you want.